heckler there. He knows exactly what he's doing. As Pam gets her fingers warmed up, we'll turn to number 636, 636. Revive us again, standing together. back tonight. It's good to see you. Boy, we had a good uh, good turnout in church this morning. Praise the Lord. You know what I did? Just preachers do this. I started counting who wasn't here. And it was like the Holy Spirit rebuked me and said, you big dummy. You had a good crowd there this morning. Why are you counting who wasn't there? Uh, and just praise the Lord for who was here. And uh, But it was. It was a good, good uh, group in the church this morning. Thank you for being friendly. Thank you for reaching out to people. And uh, I want to talk a little more about that later, but it's good to see you in church tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you're a good God. You're precious to us. And thank you, Lord, that you make it very clear that we're precious to you. Uh, of course, we should worship you, and of course, we should adore you, and uh, we want to spend time with you. We want to be near you. And yet, Lord, I don't really completely understand why you would want to be close to me. But your word tells me that, and my heart tells me that, that you really want to fellowship with me. And so, Lord, I pray that we would uh, grasp that thought tonight right here in our church, and that we would uh, fellowship with you as well as with one another. Teach us from your word, edify our hearts with the songs that we sing. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and blessed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, I wanted to say something about prayer requests. Larry Kennel is back in the hospital. What happened, well, he had pneumonia and something else. I can't remember what it was. But uh, uh, he went from the hospital to a rehab. They, he was at the rehab for less than 24 hours. They sent him right back to the hospital. So Larry is in the hospital here in Lapeer. And, uh, but be in prayer for him. Uh, he's, I went to see him, and he, he didn't look real good. Okay, But uh, we continue to pray for him. All righty. Let's turn to number 336, 336, redeemed, amen. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, 
Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think day long I sing for I cannot be silent his love is the theme of my song redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb redeemed how I love to proclaim it this child and forever I am. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor. I read something today that makes a lot of sense. It says, how do people start attending church? And it's got some percentages, and I think that we could find these are, are quite true. Uh, advertising, 2%. People see an advertisement and uh, uh, attend church, start attending at that church. Uh, invitation from the pastor, 98%. No, no. 6%. Organized visitation. That means somebody from the church knocked on their door or called them or whatever. 6%. And then finally, a friend invited me, 86%. 86%. Uh, I don't know if you've ever walked into a into a uh, a church that you're not familiar with and you're by yourself, um, and it feels a little strange. No, I happen to think that we've got a pretty friendly church, and most people are are, are comforted almost right away, feel feel uh, accepted, feel uh, welcome right away. Uh, but there's still that that thing, you know, folks. We've got the McCluskeys coming next Sunday night. I mean, please, find somebody, find somebody to invite and get them out here. We're calling it a Thanksgiving concert, and so uh, they're going to be here next Sunday night, and if you would, please invite somebody. Um, I was out visiting my cousin, uh, Bill, Bill and uh, Laura Chaffin, and Bill has throat cancer, so I went out to see him, and they, they let us know about that, so I drove out. He lives out by Otter, by Otter Lake, about a half hour from here. And as I, I prayed over him and, and asked God to touch his body and to strengthen him and heal him, and he's a believer. He loves the Lord. And, um, and I was in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to invite them to church. They've been here before. And before I could even do it, he said, you know, we might just stop by sometime. You might be seeing us sometime. And I was able then just to, to tell him, but we sure would love to have you, Bill. And sometimes it's just that simple. And uh, we just need to ask. So uh, please invite people out for church. Uh, as far as our weekly uh, announcements go, we are having our ladies Bible study on Tuesday at 10 and bearing precious seed at 1 and already starting to go through that stack of new scriptures down there. So uh, 1 o'clock on Tuesday, bearing precious seed. And then uh, the next Sunday is our uh, Thanksgiving concert uh, in the evening service with the McCluskeys. And uh, we just came up with this with our, with our, we we're looking at our schedule. And before I forget, uh, it is time for us to take up our quarterly missions offering. And we're going to give a, a, receive an offering for bearing precious seed the last Sunday of November. Okay, we'll be taking an offering for bearing precious seed. For those of you that were here for that business meeting, we, we uh, picked up a few new missionaries that we're going to be supporting quarterly. And so we'll be taking up that offering. I've got 
I've got this uh, chart here that tells us how much we need to, uh, to raise to be able to uh, pay for a ton of paper. And so we, we want to continue to, to restock their supply so they can stock our supply so we can send it back to them to send to missionaries around the world. So uh, that is coming up also. We are having our praise giving service uh, on November 21st. That's a Tuesday night. That will be our midweek service over the Thanksgiving holiday. Come for a time of music, a time in the word, and of giving thanks. Uh, also, uh, the church directory. Uh, how many of you got one this morning? Well, I had some people just, I mean, they were like this. I didn't get one. And I said, I'm sorry. Blame Kendall. It was all his fault. And uh, I said, no, it's one of those things where the excuse is not the dog ate my homework. The trimmer ate the paper, okay? So the trimmer really did. Mike messed it up. Mike messed it up? Uh, Mike messed it up, okay. You probably messed it up for Mike is probably what happened now. Amen. Well, let's have our ushers come at this time for our evening offering. Uh, going into the season where things are busy and people are running here and running there, be careful out there, but... Uh, let's remember where church is. I saw somebody just the other day. They came up to me and, and they said, well, hi, Pastor. And they haven't been here for a while. And I said, hi, Pastor. And then, you know, sort of started kicking, kicking dirt with his toe and said, I don't have any excuse. I never said a word. I guess you just felt, uh, felt under conviction. I said, I don't have any excuse. He said, we'll be back. And I said, well, I sure hope so. We missed you. And, uh, but anyhow, I'm glad that you're here tonight and uh, let's receive this offering and uh, uh, the Lord's been doing great things for us. Amen. Uh, let's pray together tonight. David, you're standing back there. Pray for us, would you please? I'd like to thank the Lord tonight and every night. Um, there's many storms I went through in my life. And sometimes I, a lot of time, all the time, I beat the storm. You know, it was, you know, as long as I got God with me and talked to Jesus around, Jesus said, I get you through these storms. But there was some time, man, that these storms, Jesus said, told me just to sit down and relax. Let me take care of this storm. Because it's too, it's too much for you. Let me take care of it. So the name of this song is on with the storm past me. Pass me by, I think. <laughs>
all stand together and sing. Turn to number 95, I think it is, isn't it? I lost mine. Now, you lost your pick, I lost my page. Oh, let's see. 519, thank you so much, Pam. 519, standing together, please. There it is. Brother David is going to come back up and share with us again. Maybe not. That's okay. We've got lots of room for Pastor. Amen. Were you going to no, sing? No, no, that's, we're okay. If he was not ready, we're that's fine. That's all right. All right. He says he's, always ready. We're, he's always ready. All righty, everybody. Let's take our Bibles tonight. David, we've got a good thing going already, okay? We don't want to ruin it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. Does anybody know who 2 Corinthians was written to? <laughs> sure. It was the ch- it was the church at Corinth. And uh, if you didn't know, there is a 1 Corinthians, okay? It would be ridiculous now. But uh, 1 Corinthians uh, was written because the church at Corinth had some serious problems. And Paul wrote them a really, he gave them a thrashing. He gave them, a, it's, it's part of 1 Corinthians is pretty stern. He's saying, you've done this, and God is not pleased with it. And you've done this, and God is not pleased with it. And you're, and, you know, you're, you're carnal, and you're acting, as, you know, you're, you're acting as the heathen act and, and things. And he really got into them in 1 Corinthians. And so we look in 2 Corinthians, and we're looking at chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 21. Let's all stand for the reading of the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading in verse 21 and read to the end of the chapter. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but our helpers, of your joy. There's a great phrase, isn't it? Helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Heavenly Father, bless the preaching of your word tonight. We thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We, uh, as I was saying, 1 Corinthians, uh, they were in a really uh, bad situation. And uh, it's not uncommon for churches to fall into patterns that are not healthy. Part of the calling of the pastor is to keep a church out of the ditch. Because just like anything else, just like our home, any other institution, just like our home, just like our government, just like a business, just, there needs to be a consistent assessment of, are we doing the right thing? And I want to challenge you with this as a pastor. What I, what I do is I look back and I'm thinking, our, what we do, is this a uh, uh, Great Commission ministry? Is it a Great Commission ministry? Is it a God's kingdom ministry? Is it something that God can be pleased with and honored by? There's a lot of good that goes on that is not necessarily 
uh, honoring to God, meaning it is not done in such a way that God is pleased with it. And, uh, you know, we're not going to have Las Vegas night uh, here at our church uh, so that we can raise money for the mission field. We're not going to do that. And as a pastor, now I know you as a church body aren't going to allow that either. But part of my responsibility as a pastor is to see to it that we keep out of the ditch. Okay? Uh, that we stay true to the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul, as a... As a uh, uh, as an elder, as a missionary, as an apostle, which means one who is sent, uh, he was very instrumental in the church at Corinth. And the, Corinth would have been, a, uh, I said Las Vegas night, Corinth, Corinth there was somebody mentioned Las Vegas in our missions meeting. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 it's not, uh, Corinth was like a Las Vegas, okay? It was a, it was a sin city. There was all kinds of false worship that went on there. And many of the ancient false, wor false worship that took place was very vulgar, very immoral, extremely. It was part of the, the rites of the priesthood and the practice of that religion to do ghastly things, to do things that are not even uh, something that we're going to even speak about tonight. And here is this church in the middle of that. It was easy for them to sway from ditch to ditch. They were overly accepting in one area, and then they were hyper-separated in another area. In another area, they refused to, uh, to fellowship with one another based on um, their standing in the community. So there was all kinds of things going on. We can read a little bit about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And, uh, and he is writing them now about having rebuked them initially, in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, it says, For godly sorrow, oh, let me see, verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, that's 1 Corinthians, he said, I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that, he, that ye might receive, damage, uh, might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What is he saying? I wrote this letter to you, and it seemed like it was just a temporary thing. You took, the, you took your spanking, you took your whipping, and uh, I was afraid it was just going to be temporary. You know, you, 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 a little child will come in, and after they had done wrong, I'm sorry. The reason why they're saying I'm sorry is they know that there's a paddle hanging in the closet. And they know they're in trouble. Well, of course, you know, what do we say to them? You're just sorry that you got caught. I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that in your life. I have had some moments like that in my life. And you know what? It didn't kill me. My dad used a belt. I tried to run away from him one time. And he had a skinny little work belt that he wore. The thing was probably three quarters of an inch wide. And it had a nice buckle on the end of it. I took off running, trying to get away from him. I got out. You know, I was doing the dance first. I was doing this. And I, 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 got, I got away from him. And uh, as I was trying to run away, he let go of one end of that belt. He let go of the end of the belt that had the buckle on it. And he caught me. Now, I'm going to call it DHS. I think we're past the, the time. They're not going to be able to get my dad for anything now. And he caught me right, right. I mean, I remember like it was yesterday. I still cry. And he caught me right there on that flank area there, that just real tender and I raised a welt, and it made me a better man, okay? You know what I learned? Don't run away. <laughs> Take your licking like a man. You got it coming. Uh, but here, they, he, he really, he rebuked them. He was spanking them. And he was afraid there wasn't going to be any kind of permanence to it. So uh, he, that's where he says, I was sorry, but then uh, not sorry, and I, uh, I, I repented. I didn't repent. I repented. Because what happened was, it was obvious now that Brother Joe, they really took it to heart. And they changed. The rebuke that, he, that they received 
uh, was truly received in the spiritual sense and they repented of it uh, in a way that godly repentance and godly sorrow, which means I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to repent, I'm going to turn from that, and I am now going to go a different direction. I'm not going to go back. And so he was pleased with that. So that's where 1 Corinthians, they were getting rebuked. 2 Corinthians, Paul was really was, was praising them for receiving the rebuke and now moving on in the right direction. You see, there were struggles in the church of Corinth. There were ups and downs. There was trouble in the church. There were church splits. There were cliques in the church. There was all kinds of, of near violence going on in the church. There was open sin in the church. And it was a real problem. And so they were rebuked. Now I learned this as a parenting skill, as a parenting uh, tactic, or, or something that's very essential. And uh, it goes on even into other areas of our life. If you're a boss and you have to rebuke somebody, but they're a valued employee, after you rebuke them, after you correct them, you got to make them feel like they're a valued employee again. That you're not holding that over their head, like you're done here. I'm all done with you. Uh, you know, it's one thing to correct a child. It's another thing to have an attitude toward them then afterwards. And many times what happens is that child who has been corrected, oh my, I, 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 I did a lot of the spanking at our house and a lot of the correcting at our house. Um, you know, my wife was there all day long with the kids and I'd come home from, from work and my wife sometimes would be standing at the door of one of the children. And I won't tell you what his name is, but uh, yeah, it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't always Kendall, but many times it was as a young man that happens as a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old young man at home with mom. Uh, sometimes it's difficult and she'd be standing there and I could tell, oh Lord, I just want to come home and take my shoes off and relax for a few minutes, but I knew what was going to happen. And so I would say, okay, Katie, Candy, Kendall, Abby, rarely. Abby wound up, I'd wind up reading a book to Abigail. Um, she had a way, she had a way. She'd come up like this and she'd go, oh, daddy. She did. Um, that never worked for Kendall. <laughs> it never worked, did it, Ken? It never worked. Uh, um, uh, but I, I remember that, to, to, be, to go and, and, and have that time of discipline. Usually what I tell one of my kids, I say, go up, go up to your bedroom, I'll be up in a minute. And I'd wait about 15 minutes. A couple of reasons why. I'm giving you parenting tips. Those of you in your 80s out there, I'm giving you parenting <laughs> tips right now. Um, what, I, what I would do, is, first of all, is I need to make sure that my heart was right about what was going on because you should never, 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 never uh, discipline a child in anger. Never, never, never. Aren't you glad God doesn't discipline us in anger? Can you imagine if God was mad at us? Wow. We should never discipline a child in anger. Never, never, never. Dad, you are the image of God in your home. While those kids are just little like that, they look up to God and you know whose face they see? They see yours. That's whose face they see. And eventually they'll grow up to a point where they can look beyond you and realize that you're just a man and you make mistakes as well and that God is a good and righteous God because you're lined up with God. When we get angry, we get out of line with God. We're not in line with God and we're trying now to go back to that this morning and what we do is we instill rebellion in the hearts of young people because we are not, we're not fair with them. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm right in my heart and usually I just want to be able to take my shoes off, take a deep breath, but also I want them to go up to the bedroom and worry about it. I want them to think about it. Anytime I discipline my children, what I want to do, it was never a spank, 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 spank. No, it was a spank. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Spank. What I want to do is draw this thing out as long as I possibly could. Why? Because I don't ever want to have to do that again. I don't ever want to have to do that again. 
And here the Apostle Paul was spanking in 1 Corinthians, the church at Corinth. And then what he did, as all good parents will do, after there's discipline like that, there needs to be a moment of, there needs to be a time of where, where the child is very concerned and very, very hurt and understands the severity of what they've done. But then not too much longer after that, they need an arm around their shoulder and say, no, you know you were wrong, son. You know you were wrong, daughter, sweetheart. But I want you to know that your dad loves you more than anything in this whole world. I'd give you anything I could. I'll do anything I can for you. And I love you so much that I'm not going to let you misbehave. I want you to grow up and be a strong young man and a godly young man, a strong young lady and a godly young lady. And I love you more than I love my own life. See, that's how God treats us. Sure, sometimes he has to spank us, but aren't you glad that God doesn't just get angry with us? And so this is what the Apostle Paul did, and he was now trying to tell the church of Corinth how important they were, how much he appreciated them, how much he loved them. This was a second letter, and this letter was to reinstate their position, that they had a secure position, a secure position. I am so glad that my position in Christ is never in jeopardy. God loves me enough. Now, sometimes you have a, the child that plays out in the street. I heard the story of a family that had a, uh, uh, they had a house and it was on a busy road. And, and uh, uh, they built a fence around the house and told the kids, don't go outside the gate. Don't ever go outside the gate. Stay inside the fence where it's safe. And the kids would be outside playing, and they had one sneaky child. And that sneaky child would open up that gate or find a way to climb over the fence, and sure enough, a horn would be beeping, they'd hear tires screeching, and there was that child standing in the middle of the road. Mom or dad go out and get that child, bring them in and discipline them and make them sit down for a little while and give them a good lecture about staying out of the street. Let them go play in the yard once again. And as they're watching them, play in the yard, there goes that child back over the fence again or opening up the gate. Eventually what parent, a, a good parent will say is, come here son, come here daughter, why don't you come in the house with me? We'll have a whole better time where it's safe for you in here. And the parent takes the child and takes away that liberty of being outside. Do you know that God sometimes calls Christians home for their own benefit? Oh my, I'm not the judge of that, please. I have nobody, I have no one in my mind right now, but I do know that God does that. God's not going to let us just run and, and disobey. He's going to chasten us because we're his children. And so uh, when we go through difficult times, it's very easy to start wondering, does God care? Or is God mad at me? Or will I ever be able, are my prayers, ever, ever feel that way? Are my prayers getting through? Or am I just praying to the ceiling? I've been told that many times by people who are struggling. I pray and I pray and I pray and it feels like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Let me give you a word of advice. Keep praying. Keep praying. Say, I don't think it's doing any good. Don't worry about whether it's doing any good or not. Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Just keep praying. So I don't think God's listening. Uh, you, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to pray. Well, I don't think the prayers are getting through. That's not up to you to get your prayers through. It's our responsibility to pray. Too many times God has come and he's touched me. When I've been astray, I've been away from him, and I feel like the ceiling's like brass, and I'm not getting any prayers through, and I, uh, to a point where I stop praying, and yet God comes through with his grace, and he lays his hand on my shoulder and says, Now, son, we need to talk. And God usually does the talking at that time. We have a lot of change in our lives. We have things that are inconsistent. We have things... Uh, uh, those of you that have uh, have a uh, mutual fund out there, 
you've got maybe you've saved money for retirement, and you've got a mutual fund, and you've got, you know, you've put money in an IRA. How are you doing? <laughs> okay, it started in November of the changing of presidents. The market went right, right through the floor. And, uh, and, you know, our church, I'm being a little, I guess I'm being a little transparent here. Our church, on an annual basis, gives me a certain amount of money to invest in an IRA for my retirement. And I'm looking at that thing. And I'm going, it's supposed to be making money. I got less money in there than what I actually put in. Who's got my money? I don't have it. It's gone. You're looking at that. Things change. Things change. Uh, we could go that, that quickly. We're, we're one doctor's call away from our whole world being stood on its head. We are. Just one doctor's call. We're one phone call away from total exasperation because we don't know what to do and anxiety. Things change. We're in a changing world. A sudden illness. The loss of a loved one. The loss of a job. Have you ever been fired from a job or laid off from a job? That is a, that is a sh shaking experience. Marriage struggles. All these things can happen and it, it causes a lot of uncertainty. Just like the church of Corinth was having uncertainty. Often insecurity accompanies change. We have this change in our life. We have some insecurity and then we have from that insecurity, we have doubt. And if we're not careful, that doubt is followed up by satanic lies. So, well, I guess I'm just not that good of a person. I guess God couldn't bless me. You see, the guy down the road, God blessed him. Why can't God bless me? I guess I'm not a very good person. And that change has brought insecurity, which has brought doubt, which brings in satanic lies. Folks, we got to be careful about this. I want just to, just to reassure you that you are secure in your position with Christ. You're secure. The church of Corinth needed to hear that. That's what we read in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1. Let's go back there. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. So we start with that. I am secure in Christ because I am established in Him. Established. I looked that up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Maybe if you've got a Bible that's got a margin, middle margin, and sometimes they'll give you definitions of words, uh, I suggest you look up these words. I say, oh, I don't understand the Bible. That's what a dictionary is for. Okay? Look it up in the dictionary. What do you want God to do? Write a comic book? Okay? Um, illustrated classic, Reader's Digest version, okay? Uh, it means to be, look it up, I looked up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is great because they use biblical illustrations. Um, the word established means to be permanently placed. Permanently placed. Now, if we look at that verse now, and, and put that in there, that definition, now he which permanently places us with you in Christ and hath anointed us, is God. I am secure regardless of the changes, regardless of what the appearance of what's happening, regardless of my, uh, of my own failures. Uh, I am secure because I am established. I am permanently placed. I said that uh, change many times will mean that we uh, uh, have insecurity, which leads to doubt, which leads to satanic lies. Uh, being permanent, understanding that we are permanently placed, that yields trust. That means I'm accepted in Him. If I'm accepted in Him, I can trust Him. He's got my back. He's got my best interests at heart. I can trust Him. If I understand that I am permanently placed in Him, established in Him, I can trust Him. I have assurance and then that assurance becomes, as I've been preaching on Sunday morning, is powerful. Once I have that assurance, I have the confidence to be able to do the work that God's called me to. Not because I'm somebody special, but because He's somebody special and I'm secure in Him. So this church at Corinth, they just got, they just got a spanking. 
I don't know. I think we could testify here a little while tonight. Let me look around. Let's see who we can pick on. Uh, and wants to testify about God taking you to the woodshed. Any volunteers? No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. God, uh, uh, matter of fact, there's some security in God taking you to the woodshed. That means you're one of his children. There have been times I have prayed, Oh God, bring conviction. Oh God, bring conviction. Oh God, bring conviction. Because I did some things that I shouldn't have done, and I didn't feel bad about it, and I got scared. God, please bring conviction. You know what? God will answer that. God answers that prayer. Yeah, no, for sure. We are, uh, uh, we are secure because we are established. When we interject this definition into our verse, we can see that we have been permanently placed in Christ by Almighty God Himself. John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29 says this, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall, does anybody know what the next word is? Never perish. Neither shall any man Pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I've heard it illustrated this way. We're in Jesus' hand. We think we're hanging on to Him and He's hanging on to us. We get, we get lost in the woods. We get lost in this life. It's not because uh, uh, God has let go of our hand. It's because we've let go of His Okay, and he's, he's got us in his hand like this. And the father has his hand over the son's hand. And we are sealed. We're going to get there in a minute. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And the devil's going, for you to lose your salvation, the seal of the Holy Spirit of God would have to be broken. The hand of God Almighty would have to be broken. Uh, the father and the hand of Jesus Christ, God's son, would have to be broken for you to lose your salvation, according to that verse. That's security, buddy. We are established. Uh, we can trust Him. We have assurance, and that is powerful. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I will no wise cast out. What if you pitch a fit and you want God to let go of you? He said, I'm not letting go of you. Just like that kid in the parking lot, screaming and hollering and pulling. And then any good parents got a hold of that child in that parking lot, and you're not letting go. They can scream and pitch a fit, and they're probably going to get a spanking when you get to the car. Why am I on spanking tonight? I don't know. Tommy, I don't know why I'm on spanking tonight. Okay. My well, kid's pitching a fit in the parking lot. The parent doesn't say, well, well, okay then, there. You're on your own, buddy. You don't say that. Why? Because you love your child. You love your grandchild. Well, Zeke decided he didn't want to hold on to my hand today. I grabbed a hold of him by the back of his bib overalls. Okay, and he, he didn't like that, but we're in a parking lot, and I am not letting that boy out of my... You can't lose your salvation if you wanted to. Do I want to just turn it back in, and, and, and I want to change in my salvation for a life of sin. I want to exchange heaven for hell, or hell for heaven. A lot of people want to exchange heaven. No. I want to go to heaven, how about you? I'm not going to... I have yet to, I have not one time in my entire life heard of somebody saying, you know, I don't want to be saved anymore. Now, maybe you have. Maybe you have. I doubt when the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, I got a feeling they haven't had a taste. It's security. The scripture says right here, it says, now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. We have certainty of assurance of salvation. And he wanted to let the people of Corinth know that. Why? Because they just had, to, they had their backside whipped. They just got taken to the woodshed by the Apostle Paul. And he didn't want them to think that God didn't love them or the God that was casting them out. I'm secure. I'm secure because I see here I'm established. Look in verse 22. Who hath also sealed us. Sealed us. And given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He has sealed us. I'm secure because I am sealed. Uh, we see this in Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. 
You ever see one of those seals? Uh, uh, like a, uh, that's what the signet ring would be. And they'd take a little bit of wax and put that on there. And then they'd, they'd take that seal or there'd be a stamp. And they would stamp that. Uh, even today, I don't know if they still do it today. A lot of stuff is electronic now. But I know back in the day, your water meter or your electric meter had a wire on it. You know what I'm saying? And it had a piece of uh, whatever, ceramic or something in there. And it had a seal on it, stamped or lead or something. had a stamp on it. So you couldn't get in there and mess with your water meter. Because if you did, you broke the seal. The scripture says here that we're sealed to the day of redemption. He sealed us. He has sealed us. In the Old Testament, when God desired to set a man apart for special service, he would have him anointed with oil. This is having him set apart for a purpose. And then what we see is that the seal is something that is a sign of God's approval. It was proof of the authenticity of of what was written or what was in the box or what was, you see it in the Bible. Uh, remember with, uh, with Jesus' tomb, they rolled that big stone and then they sealed it. That wasn't that they went and sealed it like they made it watertight. What that means is they took a, like, a, like a, a wax seal and put it on there and stamped that thing so nobody would mess with that tomb. Well, what they don't realize is that it wasn't even open from the outside. It was open from the inside. The Bible tells us that we're secure because we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. This holy seal cannot be broken. We are permanently placed. We are set aside for a specific purpose. And then we are sealed for, the, for security with God's Spirit. God has a special hold on our lives. When a child of God goes out and defiles themselves in the world, as the Church of Corinth was wont to do, they still have the seal of the Holy Spirit on their life. And what they're doing is now they are violating that seal by going out and doing things that, that are unseemly, things that they shouldn't do. But does that mean that they are broken, that that seal is broken? That doesn't mean the seal is broken. What that means is that you're violating the purpose that God has set, has, uh, set up for you. Uh, the, the seal was something that God had there, and uh, it was the Holy Spirit of God. So he's saying, uh, you have, uh, he said, now we have estab established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us. And that anointing in there, that's talking about sep separated, set aside for a purpose, who hath also sealed us and then given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Uh, I'm secure because I'm espoused. Uh, we read that there where we see who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Uh, we understand that word earnest. I've explained that from this pulpit many times, the idea of this word earnest. And it is very, very important for those who doubt their salvation. If you're doubting your salvation, you've put your faith and trust in Christ, but you're wondering, did I say the right thing? What, did I have the right emotion? Did God hear me? Uh, these things, and we start doubting our salvation. Uh, I, I want to tell you that when you put your faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. The Holy Spirit indwells you. Now, you are not a bride yet. I can't imagine. I'm thinking of Gary in a wedding dress, and it's just not working well. Uh, but uh, uh, not going well. But uh, we're espoused. We are the, the bride of Christ. But are we his bride right now? No, we're not. That's future reference. What are we right now? We're espoused to him. Okay, that is even stronger than an engagement. That is a legal action in, in Hebrew society. It was a legal action. And when you were espoused, that means more than just a little promise. That was, uh, but, but when we look at that, it's like, there's, like it is an engagement. And espoused is, uh, uh, or this, uh, the earnest money, of course, we know that uh, it's money down. And then if you violate, it's just like, well, I changed my mind. Do you get your money back? No, you don't. 
whatever you put down as earnest money, you don't get back when you change your mind. If the Holy Spirit inside of you is, the, is God's earnest on the purchase of your eternity, for you to die and go to hell, you see that? The Trinity would have to be fractured. It would cost the Trinity the Holy Spirit. No refunds. No refunds. It, will you put your faith and trust in Christ? You're a child of God, whether you want to be or not. The Holy Spirit comes in and seals you. The Holy Spirit comes in and you are now espoused to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we could get in all kinds of eschatology about end times and last days and things like that. And there's uh, such a thing. You have the, the great white throne judgment coming up and you've got uh, different judgments coming up. And you also have uh, the, marriage, um, the marriage supper in, in heaven. And uh, that's taken place, uh, I, I believe it's taken place while there's tribulation going on here on earth. And, uh, uh, but at that point, when Jesus says, come up hither, we become his bride. Until then, we're a spouse to him. And the signal, the signet of that, the ring, the engagement ring that we have is the fact that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. So if you're doubting your salvation, let me ask you, have you ever felt the moving of the Holy Spirit inside of you? Have you ever been convicted of sin? The fact that you are overwrought about whether I'm saved or not is probably an identification that you are saved, and, uh, but you're just not living right. A lot of people get that confused. We want to live like the world and then have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. No, we're operating against the Holy Spirit. We're not going to have comfort. There's going to be all kinds of anxiety. There's going to be all kinds of stress. That doesn't mean we've lost the Holy Spirit or don't have the Holy Spirit. That's a sign we do have the Holy Spirit. You ever read the Word of God and the, the pages of the Word of God spoke to your heart and you got something out of it? That's, that's for those who are born again. The Holy Spirit is teaching you. That's a sign that you have the Holy Spirit. Conviction is a sign that you have the Holy Spirit when we sin. So let me say something to you folks. We are secure in Christ, whether your 401k is secure or not. Uh, whether our, our rights as Americans are secure or not. Your eternal security is, uh, is uh, um, uh, more established than the Second Amendment of the Constitution or the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, it's more secure than the, the entire government. Aren't you glad of that? The government of the United States of America, and thank God it's more secure than the government of Lansing. We are secure in Christ, come what may. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we trust you tonight. Lord, we feel like we can absolutely put our trust in you. Uh, you're, the one who, you're the one who saved us. You're the one who has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. You're the one who uh, has, uh, has blessed us. You're the one that has sealed us. You're the one that has anointed us. Now, we pray, dear God, that each one here would have the security that they need to be able to trust you day by day, regardless of their circumstances, and also regardless of what comes down the pipe at us. Lord, I know that there are many people right now that are facing some difficult things. And Lord, I ask that you would give them strength. I pray that you would give them grace. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless our invitation tonight. If business needs to be done, Lord, I pray that tonight would be the night that we'd settle some things. We thank you for this security. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to have a time of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart and you'd like to use the altar, you can come at this time.